curious, like, when you were younger, right, like, did you ever imagine yourself being a dad? Like, I guess I'm curious, like, because, I mean, obviously humans make babies and they, you know, emerge in the world and they take up space. And I'm always curious, like, because before me, obviously, you were, you know, doing your thing and enjoying life, but... I guess did you all like was it always in your 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 goals to be a dad and like I guess like how was it um being a father like to a girl a honestly like honestly nobody comes in to the world thinking okay I'm going to multiply have an offspring because who knows what what's the future holding on to so that's never a plan it's never there's never a hit a written instruction booklet. And uh, yeah, there was no plans of even getting married or or having a child or, or, or you know, being a father. So yeah, to answer your question, yeah, I don't think uh, I was ever ready thinking about being a father. But every single day you were born, I can feel less proud and if I have to do it again, I would do it all over again just to be your father. I mean, obviously, that's very sweet. <laughs> but I'm curious, like, because, like, I mean, in Indian culture, like, obviously, there's this preference for boys, right? And I'm curious, like, was it when you were a kid, was that, like, also the thing? Like, boys were always <laughs> revered as, like, more important than girls? Or, like, was that just, like, the, I guess, like, the media's perception of like Asian culture I think like- I think uh, so all families are different growing up I was never made to think oh I'm better than my sisters or I have a better privileges than my sisters we were all treated you and my grandpa they all, they both treated us equally boys or girls um, I don't think I ever Got an extra piece of cake or extra chocolate or uh, two T-shirts for my birthday while everybody else only got one or, you know, Diwali present and one extra for me. No, none of that. So growing up, we were never made feeling special. We were all equals. We were taught to to have respect for female in the house and, you know, not just female in the house, everybody that is part of the family or everybody that we meet, as long as it's a woman, it's a girl, you give them utmost highest form of respect because we were taught a woman is not only your mother, your teacher, she's also your sister, she's also your sibling, she's also somebody that you learn to be equal partners with. Yeah. But I guess, like, in the culture, like, in, like, the streets, you know? Yeah, of course, um, in, in in a typical Indian culture, in typical Indian culture, yeah, there's always a preference. A boy child always gets what he wants to do, how he wants to do, where he wants to do. A boy will get away with 100 mistakes while a girl does one mistake. She gets, you know, oh, you're doing it wrong, you're doing this. But what about him? Uh, well, you know. So it's always watch out if you're a girl while the boys get to smooth sail. Yeah, that's just how the culture is, just patriotic culture. And yeah, fortunate for us, we never were told differentiations between being a boy or a girl. I guess like, so what was it like growing up in India? Because I feel like, you know, now India is like this big bustling country that has all of these engineers and scientists that you know are trying to modernize India to an extent but there's still you know a large part of the population that maybe isn't necessarily in like more modern situations and they use more traditional infrastructure or have more traditional community structures but I'm curious like how was it um when you grew up there back in the day per se <laughs> so growing up in 70s and 80s and 90s you know um was born in 70s so 20 just about 20 years growing up in india yeah. there wasn't much talk about 
internet or connectivity or 5G or I mean let's not even go that far we didn't even have uh, color televisions in in my growing up days uh, we had a black and white TV and the only programming good programming that we would get was Sundays Sundays was the day that you would watch this uh, serial called Mahabharat that is the story of two families fighting one good one bad fighting to retain the the kingdom you know mm. and once that program came on the streets were deserted like it's a ghost town everybody would be glued to the television and that's what everybody would be doing and nobody's outside if you're not watching that you are the stupidest person because that's how epic that show was you know and yeah there wasn't much talk about um talking about i'm talking about internet and and and, and facebook and instagram and snapchat and video calling and no none of that i don't think if there was any scientists in that time in india i never got to read or hear about that they were talking about hey, listen what about we create a platform where people could call long distance they could see each other no none of that i don't think it was even so even. what was like the thing of that time in television like, what was the big thing television see? was the big thing at that time if you so house bollywood bollywood um, <laughs> yeah i mean okay so the movies movies were produced traditionally in theaters in at that time the music and everything so the actors would perform and right across the actors would be a team of musicians that would sing and play the music so it was all live like a theater there wasn't much technology it slowly and slowly things have developed that you know they've added playback music and and recorded dialogues behind the scenes so you have better clarity of what the hero or the heroine or the or the evil or the bad dude is trying to say with all those sound effects yeah before it was all live everything was recorded live as it happened so they would have to wait for the perfect day to do a shooting or they would have to go somewhere close by where they had clear sun sunny skies no air conditioned vents you know there wasn't a vanity vent you know everything was live everything was right in front of you so yeah and i guess like since this is obviously post partition india i guess like what is like the general like feeling of indians get in like the global context like what does it mean to be an indian in in that time i guess it, for me i think the way we were told stories about partition and everything um it kind of summed down to one thing that you need to educate yourself get yourself a degree uh, find yourself a job and get on the hamster wheel nobody was talking about inventions nobody was talking about being a sports personality nobody was telling you to think outside the box and say okay you know what i don't want to do 9 to 5 job i want to be an inventor i want to open my business i want to launch a line of clothing shoes no none of that whole idea was get yourself a degree a bachelor's a masters and get yourself on the hamster wheel to provide for your family that was that was a talk growing up i don't know i think when i was probably 16 17 it just hit me from inside that yeah i don't think i want this life i need to i need to graduate and i need to find myself to go work outside in that because hey dollars are stronger it's the currency and having a life outside india it had all the shine and the glimmer and the the glitter and everything you can think of so yeah that was that was my manifestation without realizing it. actually i was manifesting it that was my manifestation that i wanted to graduate find me a job outside india and pack my bag and catch the first flight out i could and that's exactly how it happened so i guess like how do you know about the rest of the world from india like like cuz i'm assuming in india you know the majority of the population is homogeneous 
Um, it's not like your classroom has a lot of non-Indians. I mean, were there non-Indian kids in your schools at no. all? No. I grew up with strictly kids from India speaking different languages, um, different religious beliefs. But yeah, it's strictly Indians. There's, there's absolutely zero foreigners. There was zero foreigners. So then I guess, like, how do you learn about the rest of the world and nevertheless feel comfortable leaving India where, like, everybody looks like you, everybody, you know... Yeah, so we don't... Has that same we, cultural we didn't background, have, but... We didn't have world geography. We only had classes uh, about history and geography that taught about Indian history, Indian culture, Indian geography, Indian languages. Everything that has to do with the country as India is or was yeah. in that time and age or let's say from the times we were invaded by the British and before the British, the Mughals and you know, all that all that past all the way back. Yeah. Back to like the like the, the pre and the original pre and post, ancient Indian civilization. Right, pre and post um what do you call uh, independence. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there wasn't any talk about oh UK as as a country or United Soviets Russia as a country. No, there was no there was absolutely zero talk about foreign policies, foreign governments, foreign languages. Absolutely zero. Schools don't in that time didn't teach you none of that. It's only now recently, you know, with with the modified uh, school education system, internet has connected the world to India and vice versa. The the kids are beginning or being taught about the rest of the world. And of course, their jobs, their futures, their work ambience, everything. They've been taught about it. But yeah, in my time So then how did you then how do you expose yourself to the rest of the world? Nevertheless, yeah, like is there was absolutely zero yeah, exposure. Yeah, how are you even Yeah, because I guess like what was it like then meeting people that were non-Indian for the first time and like realizing the breadth of different types? Because when you left India, you went straight to the Caribbean, Correct. right? And so that, I mean, is a completely, I would say, 180 from like Indian culture, which is very much, like you said, patriarchal yeah, and very because like, I was, traditional and The moment I landed on the airport, my boss told me, don't mingle with the locals. The locals are bad. The locals are this. The locals are that. So for the first couple of months, I avoided communication, talking to the local staff that was working at my first job. But slowly and slowly, when I started realizing there are people just like me, they talk, they make jokes, they want to come closer, they want to understand my lifestyle, what I do, how I do, and why do I do it that way? I became more and more curious trying to understand them, trying to find a mutual connection. And before I realized everything that I was told, it was a complete lie. And I had everything in common with them. They were just as curious about me as I was for them. And that was it. That was it. I started picking, yeah, I started picking languages with them. Uh, the first few words I learned was Patwa, which is a dialect of French. And I mean, I'm utmost grateful to those girls that worked with me in the store that took time to make me understand how to pronounce it, how to say it, what it means. Obviously, they were not all the good words that they taught me. <laughs> uh, they taught me a few bad words and a few good words. But yeah, I picked up slowly and slowly and then I realized that, you know, my mind was a lot more curious than what I actually knew about it. And I started focusing on languages and I think French was the first language that I actually picked up. So. That's interesting. Yeah. I guess like, was it because French was like easier than trying to understand Dutch on the Dutch side or it's just like you see French more than we see Dutch on the Dutch side of the island so it's easier to so have that I exposure. never really paid attention to what was easier or what was harder. I think the reason why French came um, right away to me because most stuff that we had spoke Patwa. So it just became a natural listening 
environment around me because they would talk among themselves in Patwa and I'm really standing and I'll be listening. They think I don't understand, but I do understand some of the words. And slowly and slowly, when I gained the confidence, I would go and ask them, hey, listen, you were saying such and such word. What does that mean? And they would look at me and laugh. Like, when did you hear that? Like, don't worry about when did I hear it. I just want to know what that it means. And I would make notes in Hindi, how it sounded to me, how it pronounced in my head, and what it meant. And I would keep those cheat sheets in my wallet. So every time I would hear them communicating and they would use certain words, if I didn't remember it right away, I would go in my cheat sheet and I'd say, ah, that's what they say. Ah, this is who they're talking about. Ah, this is what they're discussing over. So, yeah, I mean, it became, after a while, I didn't need the cheat sheet. It just became natural, like a child listening to the mom and dad talking and understands, you know, like a baby understands what the mom is trying to say. Even the mom is like, goo goo gaga, goo goo gaga, la 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 la, cutie baby. You understand? Okay, so, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> so it just became like a habit. It just became like a habit. Yeah, I see. Yeah. But do you not think like the fact that you already knew so many languages just growing up in India that like you had maybe a toolkit to understand languages easier? Because I guess like before you left India, how many languages did you know at that time? So while I was in India, I spoke my Sindhi, which is my mother's tongue. We spoke Hindi, which is the national language. English, of course, because that's the spoken and written language in our school. And then Punjabi, Gujarati, Tamil, we had, I had classmates that were from those cultures and they spoke those languages. So oftentimes you would hear them talking to their mom whenever you go. So you picked up those languages along, you know, playing with them, talking with them. But but that's would, six. That's yeah, six languages right five, off the six bat. languages, yeah. I mean, but I didn't really think that, you know, it's it's a gift one has to have to understand. Because it's common because my class is 45, 50 students of us. You know, it's a group of 45, 50 students. And 20 of us speak the same language. The, but the remaining 30 or 25 speak different languages. So it just came naturally that you understand what they're talking, how they speak, the dialect, everything. It, it just it just came natural, you know. You, I guess you, like for someone that wouldn't understand like the differences between like for example Hindi and Sindhi, how would you describe like what is the difference between them that makes them like different languages? So it's just like Spanish and French. There are quite a few words that are similar, but the pronunciation, the meanings, the way you put them in a sentence, it makes the language different. I see. And they're all rooted to Sanskrit? Yeah. Like the original? Yeah. Yeah. So the original language of... The first... One of the first... The first is, language you know, is... Just, just... Yeah. And everything else <laughs> is just connected. Um, like they say, oh, Latin is the pure language and then the English just came... I think Latin also has a lot of words that are from Sanskrit. I've never really taken time to do a research and understand it, but it's what I've heard, and I'm not saying it could be right or it could be wrong, but I just believe what I've, you know, I grew up on, so. Yeah, and I guess, like, so growing up in India, obviously, like, our, our family is vegetarian, um, and always grew up that way. I guess, like, how was it then um, opening yourself to trying non-vegetarian food and then, you know, falling in love with all the different cultures of food once you came to the island? Because I'm assuming in India, I mean, the main cuisine is obviously Indian um, with, like, some influence from, like, China and, like, that Indonesian area, but primarily Indian food. Um, I guess, like, do you recall like what were the first few cuisines that you tried when you left and what it was kind of like exploring so just just to sum it up appetite for that growing up in india pretty much everything that i tried was indian there is no 
influence of different cuisines in Indian cooking. Um, maybe if I left my hometown to go live either in the north or in the south or in the west or east, chances are along the borders where other countries join us, they might have seen a lot more influences of the food. But because mm. Bombay doesn't, where I grew up, Ulasnagar, it's heavy, dense Sindhi population. So the culture, the food, the growing up habits, it's strictly Sindhi. So our food is all Sindhi. Uh, yeah, it is true that, you know, I grew up in a family that strictly vegetarian, but I had my moments where from my uncles um, and my cousins were the first ones who introduced me to non-vegetarian, eating an egg, a boiled egg to start with, and then slowly and slowly eating a chicken and lamb and, you know, it's... Were you ever grossed out by it or were you just like, this is interesting? <laughs> no, honestly, to, to be honest, I don't think... I ever sat down to analyze food. Oh, this is gross, this is bad, this is this, or this is that. I ate it because, you know, hey, I, I want to taste it. Curiosity just took a better angle on me. And then, yeah, I'm I'm never a person who doesn't want to share. If you, if you don't tell me what it is and you tell me, eat it, try it, taste it, I will eat it, try and taste it. And later, if you tell me, hey, listen, you ate so and so. Um, and then you'll, yeah, you you'll see, gag. <laughs> yeah, that snails, I already know what they look like. If you tell me, let's go eat escargos, uh, no, thank you. Not going to happen. Let's go eat a horse, horse meat. Uh, no, thank you. I think the first time I actually ate rabbit, your mother took me to some restaurant. We We ate it. She didn't tell me. After I ate it, she told me, how was your food? I think it was her. I could be wrong. Do you think? Oh my god! I don't know who I, I ate it. You but better I think hope it was her. I think it was her. <laughs> and then she told me we ate rabbit. I'm like, mm. she bunny. Said, she didn't say bunny. You see, don't 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 make it cute. <laughs> when you say bunny, I don't want to eat a bunny. I'll eat a rabbit. I won't eat a bunny. Bunnies are cute. You know. So yeah. But yeah, in terms of eating pork and everything, I think uh, ribs, I think I ate them in, in, in the island. They're so good. Burger and Chicken I'm... Satay yeah, I'm all never... That. All the I'm, good stuff. The good I've stuff. never found myself fond of steak because I know what it is. And then, you know, Culture-wise, it kind of made me feel, you know, that's not some type of way. Yeah, I feel you. because I'm connected. I'm connected to the cow, so I never felt comfortable eating a steak. Yeah, I mean, once in a while, I would eat a burger or chicken. Yeah, that was normal and goat meat, and then yeah, try different things. But I think uh, the most fascinating food for me the first time was Thai. I fell in love with Thai food, which probably is one of the reasons why you also love Thai food. I mean, it's good stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. it's good. Like, it's good. I yeah. mean, how can you fight good food? I yeah. will say I'm very blessed that in my childhood, you food was definitely, I think, like our love language. Yeah. Where, like you would always feed me and like yeah. my relationship with food. I definitely think stems from just like us always going to try different culture's cuisine and for me i feel like i just took that for granted given how diverse st martin is but you know seeing like for you growing up somewhere where like you have so much homogeny and then going somewhere that's so diverse and so different um i just feel so lucky and grateful <laughs> honestly that you even chose to raise me there and not be like i want to go back to india and well bring you with me so don't think that the thought never crossed my mind that i want to bring you back to india but I sat down to analyze the pros and the cons. So bringing you to India to introduce you to Indian culture and protect you from boys, you know, <laughs> cannot also put me in a, in a jiffy. Eventually, you need to live your life 
And the last thing I wanted was for you to hit that you weren't given an opportunity to grow up where you had better opportunities. The reason why I left India is because I didn't feel that I was going to get a right opportunity to grow, to become the person that I, that I want to live the life that I'm born to live. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So that kind of threw me off. Like, yeah, I think it's better you stay with me in the island. And yeah, so we we made sure you went to the best school. We made sure you had the best education. And yeah, and thank God you grabbed the opportunity by the horns. Like you said, grabbed the bull by its horns. And you just flew with it. You You just excelled in every aspect of of education you wanted to. I mean, I never wanted you to get into sports, so never really... I mean, luckily for you, I never cared about... Yeah, sports, that's so. what I'm saying. So I never <laughs> forced you or pushed you, hey, listen, you need to pick up a sport or you need to do something to, 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 to you know, build up the sports angle of your of your life. But yeah. The only thing I wish I did more of was yoga, but it's not like they really had like so I think kids I think partial blame of much. that also lies on us being your parents. Um, I didn't grow up on practicing yoga, so I don't know nothing about it. Even now, if I go and take one class, I think I'll come back sore from all that stretching and and you know trying to. Tried asanas and poses and you know downward dog and you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I feel you. Yeah, I, feel you. The, I can't even think of the names, but yeah. So I think it, to a certain extent, I would say I would take the blame for that. But look, you 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 figured it out yourself. You. Well, I think it was luckily Auntie Shoba was there because, like, at least through her, I got to see, like, our culture more so from, like, our traditional yeah, perspective. Because you weren't putting on no festivals or celebrations yeah, for nothing. because <laughs> I didn't want you to feel compelled. Hey, listen, I'm an Indian. I need to celebrate only Diwali, no? But your mom is a Christian, you know? And you need to understand the religions as much as they are different, they're all connected to the one source. And your goal, our goal as a human form is to find that ultimate source that channel the energy to take the physical form that you're in. Yeah, I feel you. Because at the end of it, when you take your last breath, when I take my last breath, my ultimate goal is to channel back to that energy. How do I do that? Is I mean, we already do it, though. That's the thing. Like, we already do it. You do it when you go to sleep. Like, you do it all the time. Like, it, there's so many instances where we tap into that and fail to have that acknowledgement, the awareness. Different sectors of religion teaches you that one must find a master to guide. Yeah, Just yeah. like having a teacher yeah. in a school to teach you a language, a math problem to help you solve that math problem, an equation, a physics, a chemistry or whatever part of your education, you need a teacher that shows you how to do it. Spirituality, it's just as... Within you. It's just yeah. as necessary for one person's life. You need to find a guru, a teacher, that will help you guide how to reach that ultimate Wait. energy yeah. source that you're formed of to join back. Otherwise... Getting back, getting sucked back into the temptations of the world, money and greed, envious, jealousy, sex, the lust, obstacles, name yes, it to your dharma. Yeah, it's it's it keeps it keeps you spinning in this world in a circle in this worldly pleasure. Yeah. I mean, I see people focusing strictly on one and one thing only. Oh, I want to be rich, a rich. In which way? Financially or spiritually? There's different kinds of rich. Yes, there's, exactly. There's different kinds of rich. Um, I remember a story. I think uh, 
I read it, or maybe grandma or grandpa told me, my grandmother and grandpa told me, that there was this rich guy who had a beautiful big house, all the luxuries that one can think of in his house. Every night, he sat down on a table eating dinner all by himself. But just as he would walk up to his bedroom, he would hear distance, in the distance, he would hear music from the gypsies and he would see the fire, the campfire, and he would hear music. He opened the balcony door, he would hear the music and the singing and the drum beats and he would be like, where is it coming from? So one day he asked one of the servants, where is this music, where is this laughter coming from? I hear, I see the fire, I hear people, I hear kids where is it from? So the servant answered, Master, these are the gypsies that are working in your field daily. But what are they so happy about? They they labor from... They're poor. Yeah, Why do they, they care? <laughs> they, they, they labor from before the sun rises and just about when the sun is setting in that hot sun, sweating, working on my farm, they have no roof over their head, they eat what I give them, leftovers from our kitchen, and what is it that they have that they are so happy? It's because they, the one thing that they have is non-attachment. They're not attached to anything. They don't believe in owning worldly things, possessions. possessions. Yeah. For them, spending time with their kids, teaching them how to be a noble citizen, working hard for your meal, enjoying your meal with the family, sharing it with the ones who don't have. It's the ultimate goal. And that's what, when they go to bed, they go to bed, they sleep profoundly because they don't have to keep an eye open. Somebody's going to steal their gold, somebody's going to steal their clothes, somebody's going to rob them. None of them have nothing that can be stolen. So they go to bed peacefully. And here you are, tossing and turning in the most comfortable bed that you can think of with all the worldly pleasures, but you can't seem to rest because your mind is constantly thinking about the deals you got to finish tomorrow, people you got to meet tomorrow, the meetings you have, people you got to pay, what if the crop doesn't come? You are attached to this materialistic world. And that changed the merchants, the owners' mentality about how life should be. So, yeah, I mean, I did pass through a specific time in my life. There were a few people. I shouldn't say a few. Yeah, I should say a few people. I'm not going to take names that stood by me like my rock and I'll be grateful until I die to these people. Somehow or the other, I managed to find back my, my balance and I've realized not to think of possessing or owning anything. I mean, non-attachment is very difficult. It is so difficult because it's like our egos want to cling to everything, like everything, the people we meet, the things we enjoy. If it brings us some sort of like happiness or pleasure, we feel like this compulsion, this this like addiction to wanting it, to needing it. It's like though like if you lose it, you're somehow going to be like shoved in this dark dark cave if you don't have it and like for me like I, I've been constantly watching my attachment to things and it's kind of scary because it's like I can feel how strong it is especially to like certain people or certain things that I have that like like it turns you almost into a monster forgetting like that you're this human being and forgetting that like at the end of the day like you don't take anything in this desire realm with you when you so there's there's a way I guess there's lead, a way you know you, you to transcend slow things this down place to control it's all starts in your mind 
I mean, everything is yeah. in the mind. This is what yeah. I'm learning. Everything that, starts like, in the mind. I'm not going to lie. You know, it's ironic because you said like, oh, you wanted to send me to like the best school so that I could learn like the best of the best, yeah. right? I realized like recently, and I'm not upset that you guys did that at all because obviously like I love to learn and I loved learning everything that I've learned about the world and like humanity, I think. Like I absolutely love it. Um, but I realized like you were saying that like it's the one thing that school never taught me and it kind of like broke my heart to realize that this was such a huge gap in my education was this concept of the mind and the importance of the mind and the role that the mind plays in literally everything that we do in our entire experience it is all dictated by the mind but our lack of awareness around the mind and the power of the mind allows us to feel like we're like this cage inside of a box instead of realizing that we're this creative being here with an intentional purpose you know and like we have this body as a gift of the mind to be able to go out and sense the world and actually engage with it instead of just being like a, a trapped observer watching the world through like a painting you know what I mean like you're actually a player instead of just an audience so, member. So and I don't know. It's it's been interesting to to try to go in the other You do you do definitely have instead of going outside hit the nail on the head. Um the education system I think is flawed. It's only teaching you the basics of what the entrepreneur, the commercial side of the world requires from you. But the spiritual side, nobody's tapping into that energy. And uh, yeah, it needs to change. So my advice for you going forward with your life, whenever you bring in a life form in your life, a baby, make sure, regardless of what the schools are teaching them, from the moment you understand that they're able to understand Whatever you're teaching them, whatever he or she is learning, you teach them how to tap the inner source of energy. To step. And that's tap. the thing. Like, I don't personally feel like I could bring life into the world until I sufficiently feel confident. But that's what that I'm saying. Whenever. That. Whenever. So, how do we break a chain? Somebody needs to awareness. Exactly. Somebody needs to take a hammer and say, you know what? That's it. This this stops right here. Could be a form of an abuse, could be a form of mental uprising. Any, could be yeah. a change of anything thought. Anything that's bringing Somebody a needs, habitual feeling I don't of know, suffering. Habitual. I don't know how many more people you can advise this, but I'm sure with your audience that are gonna listen to this program. I want the women and men that are listening to this podcast to understand whatever the schools are teaching, whatever your kid is going to learn in school is absolutely fantastic. Please, please, please find some time to teach them the spiritual part of it. And I'm not talking about your religion, Christianity, Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism. I'm not talking about a spiritual, specific part a dog i'm not talking about the specific exactly i'm not talking about yeah a religion that you guys believe in i am talking about connecting your soul to the higher power self to the one energy that we are all part of the goal of ancient aliens the infinite consciousness the ancient aliens before they left this world how we found it, how we came to, they left with a higher purpose. Why they... Wait, what ancient aliens? So, what are you talking so about? So there are theories <laughs> who built the pyramids. There are theories, the stone age. Oh. There are theories of okay. the lost cities. I see where there you're There are theories going. of okay, okay. what <laughs> happened to the Indian Indus culture. The You mean, okay, the Mayans. The Mayans. Okay, I feel you. I'm talking about the, the Indian. The, the, Indians. the speculation. Yeah, so, yes, yes, so, I know. The ancient exactly. Indians that left their entire beautiful yeah, so, sewer system city abandoned. Yeah, so what Nobody happened? Nobody knows why. Why there is absolutely no trace of not even one bloodline. What happened? Where did they just vanish? 
So there's a lot of mysteries that either we know or we don't know. I think we know, but we don't know because we lack the awareness. Exactly. So when I say ancient aliens that that came upon, they just woof. I mean, we're aliens. You know, what is one true. weird life form Very to true. another weird Very life true. form, right? Alien is just a concept of a word, right? Like, it I'm represents sure, an idea I'm of sure foreignness. I'm sure my cat thinks she's my master and I'm her servant. You know? I mean, in your relationship with her, I bet that is so, the, the dynamic. <laughs> so she tries to communicate in the language that... Feed me, peasant. Yeah, in, in the Feed language that me. she thinks... She's taught me, and I try to communicate to her in the language I think I've taught to her that she listens and understands. So who's to know who's right? Maybe I'm following commands from her, or she's just following commands from me, or make me making me believe that she's listening to me. You get my point. So, so yeah. coming back to what I was saying, um, your listeners they need to understand that apart from what has been taught in schools, we deserve to teach our kids how to connect the inner self to the high power, high source of energy that we are all part of. Total consciousness, exactly. yes. And teaching them to meditate instead of trying to, oh, my kid has ADHD, oh, Lex, Let's just give him drugs. Lex, uh, attention. Uh, you know, growing up, we didn't even know what is depression. What is depression? You're depressed? Go outside and play. What are you sitting home? You came home from school, and if you're going to go lock yourself in a room and draw crazy dark sketches, your mother sees you, your sister sees you, your brother sees you, you're going to get two bells. What is this you're doing nonsense? They're going to burn the book until you go outside and play. <laughs> yeah. Find yourself to keep yourself occupied. Why are you... I mean, we actually looked, me personally, looked forward coming home from school because I grew up with a huge family. My grandfather had five brothers and they had kids and their kids had kids. So everybody, all my cousins were somewhat similar in my age group. So we had a whole huge crowd of Parchanis in our neighborhood and we all lived in one neighborhood. So everybody will come out and we will play games, you know, find things Yeah, I feel you. to keep ourselves busy. It's raining, doesn't matter. It's pouring, doesn't matter. It's hot, sunny day, doesn't matter. You fell down and you got a cut on your knee, rub some dirt, go home, wash it off and come back. You're not going to sit and cry. Eh, mommy, I want... No, you're crazy. You go home and you show them that you're crying, that you got hurt. You're going to get licks. Why weren't you paying attention? So better. You know, some people would say this is abusive parenting. It's not. Lack of emotional no. apathy for no. their kids. It made me, contrary, I think it, it made me stronger mentally, yeah. physically, I think so emotionally well. stronger to, to care for myself. Children I'll, I'll give you an example. Children. So, just around where I grew up, there was a park, a government park, and they had a seesaw. Seesaw in the shape of a boat. And instead of sitting in the boat, we all had bad habits of clinging on the edge of the boat and pushing it so fast that it swings really high on one side and the other side. The guy was swing it really high. And once I was on the other side and my hand slipped on the Got edge. Smacked. No. Oh, oh, my hand slipped from the from the boat, the edge of the boat, and I fell and I broke my elbow. But I didn't, I, I can't cry. I can't say anything to anybody because now I'm scared. If I go home crying, I'm going to get licks. So I just sat there in the garden on a side on a bench holding my, my elbow. And when my brother, your uncle Anil, came looking for me, it's like, let's go home. Why are you sitting 
holding your elbow. Say it hurts. So he picked me up on his shoulder. I remember it like it was yesterday. He picked me up, he put me on his shoulder and he carried me home. And then when mom asked me, I told her, yeah, it's hurting me. Um, I let go of the swing and I fell on my elbow. They rushed me to a bone specialist, took x-rays to find out, yeah, I broke my elbow. But yeah, I mean, I didn't cry. They fixed me up. Back is new. Six or three months, I think. I had to wear the, the cast. Yeah, six weeks or three months, something like that. Yeah, I was back is back running, doing everything that I was doing before and before I had broke my arm. So emotionally. You no, know, it's interesting yeah. that you mentioned that because Will brought up this interesting point because you know how I told you he had hurt himself. Um, he was thinking like that like you were saying that like most people in that instance if they had ex- were experiencing the pain that he was experiencing would just cop out and say like i can't do anything like i'm hurt, i'm in pain like and like cave to the to the sensation of pain when it's like this concept that we've been trained to look at as like debilitating if you have pain that means you have to just like completely just break down um, and you can't be functional and he was saying that like you know this idea of like our bodies having limitations are all things that we said absolutely minds, it's all in the know? mind and that like I was just gonna correct you our and say physical it's all, limitations it's like all are all things that we perceive it's you know? all in and the mind if, if that is that the actual absolutely. limitation absolutely. of people if because you, like you see with like people like Wim Hof who defy things that science says people should not be able to do but we do them if you if you look at if you look at the boxers the major yeah. title holders, they would actually get into the ring to beat the crap out of each other. You don't think they felt I it? Mean, you yeah. don't think they realized that, it, that hurts. it hurts? They did, but they went in the ring blocking that point in the mind that tells them it's going to hurt. Yeah, they felt the pain and everything afterwards but because they didn't they came, let it shut them exactly, down exactly they were able to step absolutely, away from it absolutely. look at the yeah, pain absolutely. and react in a way that helped absolutely. them in their in their strategy absolutely. In the game. you know majority of the fights are won um with a mind game you i believe so 100 you go in front of your opinion you go in front of your opinion and, right? <laughs> and you stand tall and you look at them and you intimidate, intimidate them, them. The person that gets intimidated already knows I'm going to lose. Loses. He's gonna he's yeah. gonna be the crap out of me. So once that thought sits, yeah, that all it takes is that one itsy bitsy Punch, yeah. teeny <laughs> tiny seed of doubt in your mind, and, and that's, that's it. it. You lost that fight before you even enter the ring. Even before, yeah. yeah, before you yep, even yep, tried. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. So I mean, this not this is not the only time I broke my hand. Uh, I remember. We were playing cricket. I broke my nail. I broke my thumb. I had big uh, gash on my inner thigh. Bruises. Bruises on my yeah. inner thigh. I remember. Um, in India, I broke my my thumb and my my wrist playing cricket. Yeah, I mean, if I can go back and think if any of those times I felt the pain, I don't think so. Because I just blocked it off. I mean, it's not easy when that ball hits you on your finger and the nail just goes flying. It just literally pops off your finger. Trust me. The sign of the blood. It sounds painful. The sign, the sign uh. of the blood. Some just pass out. And I remember <laughs> playing the game, winning the game, coming home, putting turmeric and oil and bandaging with, with the regular napkin. And before you know, two weeks later, I have a brand new nail. The wounds all healed. Because the body heals itself. Like, that's the thing, too, with, like, illness and sickness. Like, we take all this stuff thinking that that's going to heal you. And the thing that heals you is your body. Like, like that's the thing that's going to heal the cut. That's the thing that's going to make new skin. It's going to make new bones. It's going to make fresh blood. It's going to make, you know, white blood cells that go and attack. You have millions of cells that that are constantly fighting to fix you why wouldn't you give it a 
constantly. Yeah. Why wouldn't you give it a chance? Like it's better than any Absolutely. doctor because it's Absolutely. your body. It knows Absolutely. you best. It knows exactly what you need in the perfect amount. Not a little bit too much, not a little bit yep. too little. It knows exactly yeah, what, what it you needs need. to the point where it actually sends out its reproducing cells before the actual damage begins to happen. It creates yeah. a line of defense. And it's the Absolutely. symptoms. The symptoms that we experience uh -huh. is our body doing uh -huh. its job. And oftentimes we're like, oh, this is an inconvenience. A runny nose. Like, I can't do this. I need to work. And it's so sad because I'm like, your body is telling you that you need to heal. And it's trying to heal. And all you can think about is putting yourself in this high stress state, which actually weakens your immune system, making it harder for yourself. I think it's also heal. to do with... And then uh, you're, once we see the first sign of nose drip, headaches, we start telling ourselves, oh, I'm coming down with something. I'm coming down with something. Yeah, so, the uh, negative exactly. cycle. Everything that we listen, everything that we tell ourselves, it's actually making powerful. it happen as we speak. So if I say, you know, it's crazy. instead of telling it's myself, so crazy. I'm getting sick, if I say, oh, my body is healing itself, it, it actually starts doing that. So what... I mean, the placebo effect is a scientifically measured thing. Yeah, like, yeah, we know absolutely. this works, and yet we're we're not using it as standard yeah. practice. We would rather drug you and charge you a bajillion dollars because for that. Rather that's than how it is. Making you, know, the you medication, feel empowered and the medication the keeps power of your The being. pharmas, the doctors, the labs profitable. The company's profitable. And of course, in return, portion of that goes to our chosen politicians, which look at, oh, we shouldn't be doing that to say, no, I cannot shut these down because they are the biggest donors to my campaign. So they close our close their eyes and say, okay, I don't want to know. Do what you got to do. Send me the donation. Send me, buy 50 plates at my next charity dinner. So... Yeah, it is what it is. We we humans are the ones that are corrupting our own kind, destroying our own kind. Do you kind. think it's us or do you think it's the money? Like the motivation of money as like this it's artifact of attainment, of material possession. Yeah, but humans that have I'll, I'll give you I'll I'll give you my reasoning why frame of mind because can't if you help themselves. if you look at the ages of cavemen, yeah? There was no money. There was no money. They didn't know. But they still fought with each for, other. For what? Saying. Yeah, like, for what? But the, I mean, back then they didn't have the awareness of understanding that tribal lines are a delusion of misunderstanding of the Because ego. at that time it was, they wanted the woman the other caveman has because she's the best gatherer, uh, what you call that? The one who goes... Not the most fine. No, no, no. They didn't. The I don't pack. think it was anything to do with the beauty. About attraction. And she was it's just functional. Yeah, she she knew where to get the best berries and fruits and what do you call that? What's the word? Um, the one who goes in the forager. Yeah, there were forager. Oh, yes, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah. the word I was thinking of. She was so everybody wanted, and she took care of the offspring. So everybody. So first, it started with the woman. Next. It started with who has more more animal skins or better cave or it's the comparison. Yeah, it's the this human. Is all, this is the ego that's it's it's in a wrong. So, so it's nothing health, to do with money. You know what that's I mean? what I was trying to come down to. There's nothing to do I see. with money. It's the human. Money is just the tool. It just happened yeah. to be. But I mean, it just happened to be over the years, over the centuries. We it's gotten to this. Point. We educated ourselves became better in understanding what our lives are. We found minerals that were more rare, more precious looking. And that according to yeah, us. And that took the the stage. The new uh, obsession. Exactly, it of, became the new I obsession. want more of this. And then we built the next I toy more and then that this. became the new Correct. obsession. And then we built the Correct. next toy and that became the new Correct. obsession. First it was spices. Uh -huh. Well, actually no. First it was uh -huh. metals. Then it was uh -huh. spices. Then it was uh -huh. technology. And now it's crypto. still technology. Now it's crypto. Or, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Crypto is technology. Yeah, I mean, it's right? part of the it's technology. The same but thing. What I'm saying is people are moving away from traditional currencies. 
Yeah, but it, it's all still representing ownership, That's right? It's still this possessive and nature. Who, it's, and it's created by who? Because like the East, it's created by a human. What do you mean? That's what. Oh. I'm, but again, like okay, if we're if we start from this premise of when you enter this desire realm, right? We're all on this very basic frequency where we have these bodies we can sense things we can interact we can move in free well what we deem to be free uh-huh. space because we have this concept of time we can measure that science gives us all these formulas to help us predict the world so we feel less uh-huh. scared none of that brings about any solution to happiness or like resolving that internal suffering that we feel but then when you go to the east they talk about this whole thing of there is no um, analytical framework and that's just like one way to look at it but where they're looking at it is from this perspective of like we're in a conditioned reality and the reason that we see the world that we see the reason that the words that we use even have value to us is because there are other humans that build this reference that justifies the value for things and if it was just one human on one earth it would be meaningless to even have language because who would you be talking Absolutely. to Similarly with like gold and technology, the only reason technology is useful is because we're all using it. If, if there was only one computer and only one person had it, what use, what use would yeah. that have? You know, it's, it's the connection that we get by having all of us, the interface of our experiences together. That is what gives our individual realities value. That's what God's color yeah, but you and see, dimension people went and added, to apart our experience. Apart from what you just said, People went and added multiple aspects of, oh, you have one of this, I have five of this, you have zero of this. But that's that, ego. That's what I'm saying. This is where comparisons of of ownership came into play. That, oh, you have one, I but want I one too. That, that, so competition. This like ownership thing is, a, I think, a delusion of our ego that if we resolve that delusion, if we happen. had that real, if, if people really had that awareness that there is no such thing as ownership and that that is just something of a of a facade in this desire realm that we all operate so the ownership in. part then will you never would not end. feel the need you we would all be know, gypsies you know we would all just be moving around from space the to ownership space part is never gonna end. trying to People attain will always, things always 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 um find ways different things to have the ownerships of because it justifies their, their reason exactly to live. their reason to live their reason of because they but feel they're better. You don't need that to be yeah, the reason. See, not everybody understands. There's a that. better reason. Not everybody focuses on that. Not everybody understands that. Not everybody pays attention to that. People think if I own Bentleys, if I own Rolexes, if I own gold coins, gold bars, gold um, jewelry, the best diamonds in the world, I. I'm somewhat satisfied, but it's not a it's not a level of satisfaction that they are hunting. It's more to show of their other human beings around but that they're trying to compete. Satisfied. They're trying to. It isn't. It's not. Yeah, but they're not thinking like that. Yep, they, that doesn't matter. They they they're not. They're not thinking but like that. See, They're not the thinking, thing. oh, if what, those humans what if I was there around if it was just you, me alone? Who were you showing and, off to? You know, I it always... It doesn't mean anything. I always ponder upon this question. If if I take away stomach from my body, if I wasn't hungry for food, if I wasn't chasing food, would I still be living for the dream that I have today? No. And to be you honest... You need it. I mean, no, what, where, you're right. your, your stomach doesn't know yeah. that it's your stomach. So, it doesn't know that, oh, I'm a separate thing and my job is just to process food. It's Nick. Like, your stomach is you. It's, it's like, there is no separation. Like, in, in our biology, we like to partition things and say, oh, well, you can isolate this subsystem so that it makes the problems easier to tackle with our predictive mathematical measurements. But in actuality, your body doesn't know where your stomach begins and when it ends and where is that separation from your lungs and how Very is true. that separate from your heart yeah because they all the nerves built, they were all built everything together is connected in to your brain as you grew as a baby i think i think the more right now like i'm talking to you the more i'm paying attention to one thing there is a huge reason that we never 
spend time in um learning about is why everything is connected to the, the brain it's the mind why but the listen, brain is an organ i know that's right? what in i mean that's what i mean classical material reductionist view of our world but it's the mind and the mind is in like science this is actually the big problem i heard you know i've been learning you know your your child's uh-huh. been learning um, good, the good, big good. problem the big problem is that science and psychology cannot tell us which part of the brain evokes the mind and that's the like which part of our brain gives us consciousness we don't know how yeah. does consciousness influence our emotional state we don't know how does chemicals in our brain result in these emotional states that are very subjective we yeah, don't know and these are all that, that's thing. that big problem that people don't understand and yet they make it seem as though consciousness is just this thing that we have somehow solved and it's like no 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 don't lie to the people like we have not solved it and consciousness yeah, is yeah. the entire reason why we can even have this co- like experience yeah. like people don't understand the only reason my podcast has value is not just because you and me are here talking and having a conversation like me and you will have this conversation regardless right because you're mm-hmm. my dad mm-hmm. and I love you and we talk yeah. about this all Why the time yeah. what gives it value is when other people can hear it their references acknowledge the words that we're saying and the words True. that we say resonate with them and causes change in their Absolutely. lives Absolutely. that is what gives it value and that yeah, is something that true. is immeasurable that is something that you could never measure you know yeah, what i mean because yeah. it's like you go and you have that conversation with that one person that taught you that one word and now as a result you learned this whole language and then Absolutely. you can go and have these I'm connections with all these grateful. new people and I'm they utterly don't know grateful to all these people they don't, they don't know, know it know. no but to me i think uh, a lot of people don't seem to realize that they think people just pass through their lives and and it just means nothing nothing but that's not true it means there everything there is absolutely a lot that you learn or little that you didn't learn it's From how you look at it every engagement every engagement every is, single is one is the way you approach the situation if you didn't approach the situation as i'm going to learn something from it obviously you put a a brick wall in front of everything that you could have learned from that person but the moment i dropped down like what i told you when i first landed they told me oh don't mix with the locals don't talk to the locals keep away from them they are bad influence and i had a temporary wall you know i would keep away but the so moment that's fear and I, ignorance i mean for someone that I'm grew saying. up where you've only see people that look like you i i can humbly understand the day the day i dropped i broke down that wall yes the day the day i broke down that wall and i started paying close attention to everything that was happening with them listening to them laughing with them and and sharing jokes with them and talking about the food and the culture and where i come from and who am i and understanding who they are and what their culture is about and why they listen to this kind of music and what does this particular word means it opened to me endless possibilities of ultimate understanding and learning mm. and to me i'm 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 amazed that i lost 3 months and to be honest um before today i don't think i ever sat down to analyze it and thanks to you i'm actually analyzing a lot that happened to me in the past and the people what kind of influence even meeting once yeah has left in my life because the ones that i criticized the ones i kept like i don't want to deal with this person even though they were trying to teach me something it's a bad way of looking at it so going back to my working um life my last job every t- opportunity i got every new person that joined my team of of sales i made sure i taught them how i overcome objections from customers when they ask me, when they say certain things what are they trying to say and how you should approach it so you should never take no as an answer because no to you is n o as it spells but no is more k n o w they don't know 
they don't know you, they don't know the company, they don't know the product, they don't know what you're trying to sell them, they don't know why they should buy from you. So I I make sure I share that part of the knowledge that don't take no that's as like a whole and, sales like a seminar yep, i'm like yeah, that's, a, that's a whole we should we should yep, you know yeah yeah should, yeah, should yeah work yeah. on that <laughs> yeah yeah most people take oh she said no um she said no as in n o that's what you understood or she said no as in k n o w nick what's the difference well the first no is what you think no i don't want the second K N O W is what I think you didn't teach them. They want to know who you are, what you're showing them, who the company is, and everything. Did you connect all those dots? Uh, how did you start? Oh, I told them I have something nice in in a ring that I want them to try on. Uh, well, did you try to find out if they were looking for a ring? No, she says she don't like it. Well, that's where the problem is. You didn't take time. You didn't take time to know what they want. You took N O and put the piece back, lock the case, tell them thank you for your visit. Here's your free gift, and show them through the door. While what you should have done is practice on K N O W. Know your customer. Know what they want. They want to know about you. Tell them about the company. They want to know about the company. They want to know about the product. Those are the aspects you gotta, you gotta connect on a level. It's the humanness. Absolutely, you gotta connect at the level of humanity. Make them understand that you are here to listen. To me, business is about serving people. That's literally what okay, it so, is. Okay, so so the kind of work that I do, I did, didn't. I mean, yeah, it is service. Yeah, but it's majority, serving their indulgence. But majority of it, to, majority, you know? <laughs> yeah, the majority of it comes from building a dream, making it a reality for them, creating a dream of them owning a piece of luxury. So. To a certain extent, I think it's taking advantage of unwilling, unknowing people that don't understand the limitations of their finances. Because you go and take that extra two dollars that they need to save for something more important that might happen for them in future, but you make them to commit that two dollars that they're gonna earn. To pay you for what you want them to own, creating a false ownership of something luxurious. And what past two years of of pandemic taught me is, when I see people losing jobs, when I see people not being able to pay rents, not being able to provide food for their loved ones, not being able to get medication, and everything that they thought that they bought because it's luxurious, it's gonna maintain its value. When it came, they needed to sell it. <laughs> they were offered peanuts. They were offered peanuts because people took advantage. And yeah, what they thought was luxury, it's actually not even gonna give them a slice of bread. So I guess, like, how do you then look at like the jewelry industry, which is like all about? You know, this diamonds will last forever. Diamonds are a woman's best friend. Like, you should buy it. Spend your life savings on a diamond. If you don't love her, you will not get her a good diamond. The bigger, the better. You know, how do you go from, how does, I guess, like, from you working in the industry, do you see how they justify Because I know rock? the ins and outs of the industry, I could tell you one thing. For our lifetime, we'll never run out of diamonds. So, as far as the investment is concerned, yeah, I don't think so. There are better investments in life. What about like gold and silver, which are, they say, God's medals, God's currency, because God put it here, versus money, which is man's currency, because we invented it. So, because 
all these things are difficult to mine. They put the value as precious. Imagine you walking down on a trail and you see uh, a natural waterfall and at the end of the waterfall you take a dip and you come out with a handful of rocks and they're all beautiful crystals. Those crystals wouldn't be worth anything much. But now if you start marketing those crystals as, oh, you, there's only one place in the entire world, you got to trek 5,000 miles up the mountain, this particular mountain to reach to this waterfall and only dive down deep, deep in deep, the trenches. Deep, deep in the trenches of this waterfall to find this crystal. This one piece one of rock crystal and that's been have, there since the dinosaurs. Uh, exactly. Now you marketed it to make it sound exclusive, rare, so difficult to get. Only one place in the world that can find it. Now, automatically, I want it. I want it. I want people start going crazy. So, the more people want it, the higher you can ask price, you can ask for it. And that's exactly what has happened. So, it's like marketing has convinced a Absolutely. large amount of people to value something that's meaningless. Absolutely. And so, as a result, they can charge you an arm and a leg. Absolutely. For it. Do you know, De Beers will never come out openly and say, what their stockpile is? Of course not, because that determines um, the value. For those who don't know, De Beers, De Beers controls an all X, of it. No, no, X percentage of worlds diamonds, that are diamonds, right? Diamonds or that are mined all... in the world. Yeah, they control. They were an like X. the OG, like they're the they're the people that created the whole diamonds. Uh, woman's best friend. Yeah, you know? of course. I mean, how else do you sell something that you have a lot of? Obviously, you have to market it and. How else do you market it by putting a beautiful woman smiling just because she got something shiny and special to create that feeling? It's something luxurious and making her feel you that she's girls that, that that's what that's love the only, is. Exactly, the true love doesn't come from material things. True loves come from having genuine connections with your family, being there for your kids taking care of your parents, regardless of the age or the health condition, taking care of It's just animals, unconditional. It's just unconditional support. Un providing for people who can provide for themselves. The most important of all, sharing the knowledge that you have learned without thinking of what you're going to get in future for it. Not expecting any gains, anything in return. Just being human, helping out somebody yeah. else. I yeah. think I think that is the most precious thing you'll ever actually get. The from. most valuable and yet it's free. Absolutely. To see somebody struggling and you help them, you get to see them smile, you get to wipe their tears. You know, mom always says, Blessings come from all different aspects of life. Something good happens to you. Somebody's thinking of you. Somebody's blessing you. Um, you thought you were going to be late at a meeting. You're driving. And every signal you pass, you're getting a green. Somebody's looking out for you. Don't think you're lucky. It's somebody's blessings that is making sure that you get green lights all through so you reach two minutes just two minutes before your meeting your big appointment or wherever you need to be um you have your head buried down in the phone and you're walking and all of a sudden somebody taps you on your shoulder as you turn back a bike or a car zooms it right in front of you you don't see who it was but that little tap saved you from taking that extra step that would have get you right on that rash driver. It's somebody's blessing. Something you did, something you said to somebody that made their day, that smiled, and that's a blessing. Even though they didn't say, bless you, 
there is a higher power, there is a higher source, there is there is a, a law that looks and notes that down. So every opportunity you get to do something good, regardless of if you expect, you should never think of what or what isn't what in it for me. It's not a business transaction. Just do good. Just be good. Just be noble. Doesn't hurt. Trust me on that one. I've experienced it firsthand. I've seen people walk up to me, say something in my ear and walk away. And before I sat down to analyze what did they say, turn around to look where they are. You don't see them. You ask somebody, hey, did you see that person? Who are you talking about? I didn't see nobody. Are you sure? You didn't see this? No. What are you dreaming about, Nick? Wake up. Many times, I'm sure you realize you walk into a, a place and you're like, I've been here. I've seen this. I've seen this cup. I've seen this book. I've seen this. I've seen this color. I've seen this door. Is that tapping in? Yep. Is the yep. tapping in? Because subconsciously, your we energy. Do it all the time. Your energy has taken you there. It. Many times. Many times. Many lifetimes. Yep. yep. Many years. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. I will say, though, like, I, I do feel very blessed that, you know, I think it takes a lot of bravery to have anybody leave their country, nevertheless, one where everybody is like sort of like a sounding board for just more of yourself. You know what I mean? Like your ideas, everything like that. And to go abroad and to find love in like the most unconventional of places in a little Caribbean island and to have a kid that technically in the culture would be deemed as lesser than compared to a boy and still push through and like cultivate your own path and not let anybody sort of step in your way and more than anything like create a safe space for me to grow and to feel like no matter what I wanted to do that I could do that and I think like for me that was the greatest gift that I could have ever gotten from you guys was just just like unconditional support and absolutely love and because like we loved you we love you we love me. you for I mean I love you for every breath that I take um and Part of that, I'm grateful to my father. God rest his soul. He's living his best years with our guru. With all of us. Yeah, with, yeah. with guru. With He's us. up watching and blessing. And his words when I asked him, Dad, are you okay me marrying your mom? And he's like, son, I understand what you're thinking. It's your life. You have to realize at this present moment, are you going to be happy with this person? And if the answer comes out without even single cent of doubt is yes, you got her blessings. If she wants to come and visit, bring her. We are more than happy to receive her. And believe me, she would be cherished with open arms. And every time she went, they gave her love. Your grandma doesn't speak a word, neither does much... Uh, of my dad spoke English, but they got along. They spoke, they showed her how to cook, and yeah, I mean, she was perfectly fine. They loved you from from the baby ages. He came, he came, visited you in the island. Yeah, I mean, you guys connected. It's like he knew you, who you are, and you knew who he is. It's like there was unspoken bond between the two of you. So... I mean, I feel like you were, we're all on these contracts, right? So it's like you're just meeting yourself in another form and that love is always there. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I think the biggest thought, the biggest connection that one can feel is the connection of the souls. And as long as you feel that soul connected, no matter where you are, no matter who you're with, you will always feel the love You'll always feel the person thinking about you. You cannot develop like a sixth sense. Like just before you call me, yeah, I, feel I like was you. just about to call. It's like a ping. I'm telling you, bro, I've been working on yeah, it. I've been it's, working it's, on the tapping yeah, in. It's, it's like a ping. <laughs> you feel it's like uh, that zing that you feel. It's like uh, it's the knowing, yeah, the awareness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like hey, somebody or hey. And again, to to... space and time, these are all concepts of having an observer, Absolutely. you know, if without that, there is none of that. And so 
if you can tap into that higher consciousness, this this total consciousness, you arrive at a place where time is still. Absolutely, and I think all moments exist. And most people say, all "Oh, but how come I exist. don't have that awareness? How come I don't feel like that?" Everybody, everybody has. has, it. has Everyone, it. it's just nobody can tell you out. that you don't have it. Yeah, it's just figuring how, out what is the way how to to get you there. Yeah. What is yeah. the way for you? Yeah. And that's the thing. Everyone's going to be different. Absolutely. You know, I was just about to say the same thing. That, that works for them. Channeling your energy doesn't mean you got to sit in a calm room, meditation, yeah. in a dark saying space. Yeah, one specific don't. chanting, one specific word. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be different for you, me, your mom, my uncles, their kids. Everybody goes through different way of finding that connection. But but we all have but it. But the it's one thing that, this that the whole time. the one thing that doesn't changes is the belief. You gotta believe that you can. You gotta believe that you can connect to this higher source. You gotta believe that you're able to connect to this higher. I don't even know why people need belief. I'm like, is living I think, not enough belief? I think the what? reason why I focus and I keep insisting on belief is because for every day-to-day aspect we use belief but we don't realize the power of belief I'll give you an example in the night we brush our teeth put on our pajamas go to bed with the belief I'm gonna wake up tomorrow all all I couldn't do today all the tasks all the Aspects of my work, the programming, the the deadlines, whatever, 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 whatever yeah. that needed to be done today that I'm not able to get to. I know I'm gonna work on. Oh, I need to do this. It's some sort of a belief. Most people don't sit down and think that they're actually channeling the belief into it. Into their yeah, exactly. Lives, yeah. Because we Every don't day, pay all we the don't time. pay attention to it. But it's the belief no. that runs just everything as we breathe it's a belief that i'm gonna have the next breath in and out of my lungs exactly just as the belief i'm gonna put on the tv i'm gonna see and the show, show is gonna turn on is the same yeah thing.